Hi guys, Mr. Martin back here again with today's video on how to apply congruence and triangles. Let's get started. Let's first start out with a good definition of what congruent figures are. Two congruent figures, or two figures are congruent if they have exactly the same size and shape. If you were to cut out one of the two congruent figures. Okay, so one is now able to be placed on top of the other. Okay, so you could then position the cutout figure so that it fits perfectly onto the other figure. So if you can position it right over the top of the figure without any overlap, or meaning any parts hanging over the side of the other figure, then we can say those two figures are congruent. If you laid um, one figure on top of the other, and a part of the figure was sticking out, and there was a you know an angle that was a little bit bigger than the other, or a side that was longer than the other, then we would say those are not congruent figures. Okay. All right. Let's talk about corresponding parts of congruent figures. In two congruent figures, all of the parts of one figure are congruent to the corresponding parts of the other figure. So, in other words. The longest side of one figure is congruent to its corresponding side, which would be the longest side of the other figure. The smallest angle of one figure is congruent to the smallest angle of the other figure because those parts correspond with each other. Okay, We'll take a look at an example of that in just a second. In congruent polygons, this means that the corresponding sides and the corresponding angles are congruent. All sides of one have to be congruent to all sides of the other. And likewise, all angles of one figure have to be congruent to all angles of the other figure. Okay, So let's write a congruent statement. In other words, let's write a statement that says that one figure is congruent to the other. When you write a congruent statement for two polygons, you always list the corresponding vertices in the same order. Okay. Second, you can write congruent statements in more than one way. Obviously you can pick letters out of a hat in a different order. You could write a statement in a, di in a different order, but just remember the corresponding vertices have to be in the same order. Okay, So let's look at these two triangles. There are two possible congruent statements. Actually there's actually more than two, but there's at least two. But two of them that are possible for these triangles are okay, Triangle ABC is congruent to triangle FED, or we could say triangle BCA is congruent to triangle EDF. And if you notice, the vertices are labeled by color. The red matches the red, the blue matches the blue, and the green matches the green. You can tell by the, the tick marks and the arcs on the angles that the corresponding parts have to be Angle A is congruent to angle F, angle B is congruent to angle E, and angle C is congruent to angle D. They each have the same number of arcs on the angles. Okay? For the segments, look at the tick marks. Segment AB, one tick mark, is congruent to segment FE, one tick mark. Segment BC, three tick marks, is congruent to segment ED, three tick marks. Okay? Notice the vertices are in the same order. Last side, segment AC, two tick marks, is congruent to segment FD, two tick marks. The corresponding parts have to be written in the same order. Notice in the letters, when, in the congruent statements, that red matches with red. Okay, so the red letters match. Okay, the blue matches with blue. The blue letters match. And the green matches with the green. So we say the corresponding vertices have to be written in the same order. That's what we said was the very first rule up here, was the corresponding vertices have to be written in the same order. Okay? All right. Let's try an example. If we know that segment, sorry, that polygon DEFG, or quadrilateral DEFG, is congruent to polygon or quadrilateral SPQR. Now the order that the vertices are written in tells us something. We know that angle D 
corresponds with angle S because it's written first. So we know angle D has to be congruent to angle S. Regardless of how the pictures are rotated on the paper, if you match the vertices up, then it'll tell you which angles are congruent with each other. Okay? Angle E is congruent to angle P. So angle E is congruent to angle P. Okay? And angle F is congruent to angle Q. So angle F, put three tick marks, is congruent to angle Q. Okay? And then lastly, the last vertice, which is G, has to be congruent to R. Okay? So G has to be congruent to R. Okay? So make sure you got those matched up. Okay? And now we can start looking at the sides. Okay? We can say, let's take the first two letters of the first one. We can say that DE, which is the first two letters of the first polygon, has to be congruent to the first two letters of the second polygon, SP. Okay? And so let's put a tick mark on those. Okay? Then the, take the next two letters, EF, has to be congruent to PQ. EF has to be congruent to PQ. Okay? And now let's take the third and fourth letters, which are FG. That has to be congruent to QR. Okay? So FG congruent to QR. And finally, Let's take the first and the last letters. DG has to be congruent to SR. So DG and SR. Okay? So now they're asking us to find the measure or the value of X. Okay? Well, we know in the figure, now let's go ahead and get rid of the markings. We know in the figure that Okay, so we know in the figure that uh DE is 8 and QR is 2x minus 4 and they want to see if we're going to set those equal to each other because they put them both on the top. So let's investigate that and see, are those really equal to each other? Let's come over here. DE is right here, but that is congruent to SP. Notice these figures really have just been rotated 180 degrees. So this is not a true statement. DE is not congruent to QR. DE is actually congruent to SP, but SP isn't labeled. So let's come over to this one and look at QR is congruent to FG. So 2X minus 4 actually equals 12. So 2X has to be 16, so X has to be 8. Okay? Now let's be real careful on the angles as well. Okay? It says that 6Y plus x has to equal which angle? Okay, Q is the third letter in the second polygon. It's congruent to F, which is the second letter in the first polygon. Sorry, the third letter in the first polygon. So that is right here. Okay, That looks like it's 66 degrees. Or is that 68 degrees actually? Okay. All right, so we know that y is 8. So we know that 6y is 60. So y, in this case, is 10. Okay? So you have to be really careful and match up which angle goes with which angle, 
and don't look at the orientation on the page. Make sure you're reading the statement and matching vertice with vertice. Remember, the vertices have to be written in the same order, regardless of what the picture looks like on the paper. Okay, don't let them mislead you by rotating that picture. All right, let's get going. Okay, so there is the answers that we had. So you can write those down if my um, notes weren't clear. Okay, make sure you're matching angles with angles and sides with sides. Okay, let's go on. Last theorem we have to talk about is the third angles theorem. This just simply says if two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then the third angles are also congruent. Okay, we have a really quick and easy proof of this one because we know that the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C has to be equal to 180, right? Okay, let's wipe that out. Sorry about that. Let's get that, that cleaned up a little bit. Okay, sorry about that. Let's clean that up a little bit. So we have the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B plus the measure Oops. I don't know why the undo button is not working on here. Let's try that again. Sorry, we'll try that again. We'll get it cleaned up. Okay, so we'll say the measure of angle C has to be 180. And also the measure of angle D plus the measure of angle E plus the measure of angle F also has to be 180. So we have two statements equal to the same amount, or 180, so we know those two statements must be equal to each other. So we're just going to set all of those sets of angles equal to each other. Okay. But we know A is congruent to D, so we're going to take away A and D from both sides because they're equal to each other. As long as we subtract the same thing from both sides, we keep it equal, right? Then we can take away B and E, which are congruent to each other from both sides, and that leaves us with the measure of angle C equals to the measure of angle F. So we know by definition that angle C is congruent to angle F. Not a real hard proof. It's using what I like to call the IAS of a triangle, that's the interior angle sum, which we learned from the last video. Okay. Then we use the transitive property, which you know as well as I do, is one of the most used properties we've had. Then we use the subtraction property, because we know all of those angles are congruent to each other. We could have substituted them first and then shown A on both sides and B on both sides, but since we know they're equal to each other, the subtraction property says as long as they're equal, we can subtract them from both sides and keep the equality. And then lastly, we have the definition of congruent. We knew if the angles were equal in measure, then the angles themselves have to be congruent. All right. All right, let's try to use this thing. Okay, so we got this picture here. And we've got some angles marked. We've got angle... A, measure of angle A being equal to the measure of angle B. Those are marked. So we know this is 45 degrees. We've also got the measure of angle. And now since there is more than one angle at C, I'm going to label those. So I'm going to say we've got, um, with three letters, we got angle B, C, D. So that there's no question about which angle C I'm talking about. Because really, there's three angles there. There's angles A, C, N. There's angle um, 
BCD and there's angle ACD. So there's three angles there. We need to make sure what, which one we're talking about. That is the same as angle ADC. Again, there's three angle Ds there. I don't know if you see three angle Ds, but I do. Okay. So then we know then that this is 30 degrees. So if we take one of those triangles out of there, okay, that's this triangle here. That's triangle A, C, D. Okay. What they're asking us for is angle B, D, C. So if we know this is 45 and this is 30, we know angle C has to be, well, let's see, 45 plus 30 plus the measure of angle C has to equal 180. So 75 plus the measure of angle C is 180. And so the measure of angle C is 105. But we know since two of the angles are congruent, the third angle has to be congruent as well. So angle C of that triangle is going to match angle D of the other triangle. That's D right there. Okay. A lot of times it helps if you take the triangles apart and you can see that that angle C is actually not the same angle C, right? Let's mark those differently. We'll mark this one as angle D, right? And then this will be angle B up there. Okay, so the, the angle A matches angle A. Sorry, matches angle B, okay? And then angle D matches angle C, and angle C matches angle D. Now, I know that's kind of confusing, but remember, like I said, there's multiple angles at vertex C and vertex D. So when you separate those triangles, I think you can see the angles um, being uh, separated. Okay, so this is a this right here is 105. So therefore, since two of the angles are already congruent, that third angle has to be 105. Okay, here's the written out for you, and you can copy that into your notes. Okay. Let's move on to the last thing we have to talk about, and that is some properties of triangle congruence. Okay? So it's going to look really familiar because we still have the reflexive property. We say one triangle is always congruent to itself. If you had two copies of the exact same triangle, in other words, I photocopied triangle ABC, I could cut one copy out and it would obviously fit on top of the other. Okay? Then we've got the symmetric property which says if triangle ABC is congruent to DEF, then triangle DEF is congruent to triangle ABC. Again, we could cut out one triangle ABC and put it on top of the other triangle, DEF, or we could cut out DEF and put it on top of ABC. Doesn't matter. Okay? And the transitive property says if triangle ABC is congruent to DEF, and so is triangle JKL is congruent to triangle DEF, then triangle ABC must be congruent to JKL. So in other words, if triangle 1 was congruent to triangle 2, and triangle 3 was also congruent to triangle 2, in other words, if we cut out triangle 1 and laid it on top, and it laid perfectly on top of DEF, and we cut out triangle 3, and laid it on top of triangle two, and it laid on top of there perfectly, then obviously one must be congruent to three as well. Same property as before, instead of equalities, now we're talking about congruence. Hey, should make pretty much the same sense as before because those properties are the same instead of talking about segments or talking about angles or talking about um, algebraic, you know, expressions. We're talking about triangles being congruent. So that's all I have for you today. That went kind of fast, I know. Um, take a look at your notes. Make sure you've got all the theorems written down in your notes, and we'll see you in class. Have a great day, you guys.